Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Medical technologist, systems engineer, chemistry professor and researcher, psychiatrist, science teacher, computer programmer, and physicist. Careers to dream about and work for. Careers in science and technology that are exciting, challenging, fun, and important. Careers that bring with them a sense of pride and accomplishment. Careers that are possible for bright young people with disabilities. Science and technology are fields which are concerned with every aspect of modern life and of the future. How our bodies function, the laws of the universe, new products to make our lives more comfortable, cures for deadly diseases. Science involves curiosity, creativity, discovery. Let's look at some people at work at some scientists and technologists with various disabilities using their good minds and careers they enjoy. I think the main excitement in medical technology comes when you you, after you've been doing routine work for a long time, if you suddenly see something interesting that you read about and that happens when you're working in a big laboratory. All of a sudden, you'll say, "Oh, look at this! I, you know, I read about this a couple of years ago. You know, this is a real rare thing." Or, or everybody gets out the books and everybody gathers around, and looks in the microscope, and and also you know that that you're helping people. You know, this is sometimes saving their lives. Lorraine Poor's expertise helps other people make decisions, decisions that can save lives. Her work is exacting and carries a great deal of responsibility. Lorraine is a medical technologist. She works for Cigna Health Plan of California. She's obviously proud of the responsibilities she has and knows she's doing something important. Okay, technologists, depending on what department you work in, uh, are responsible for recognizing abnormalities in cells or uh, cultures or whatever the test is they're doing. They have to, they're responsible for making the decisions as to whether there's an abnormal result or not. And this is the Technicon H6000. This is one of my favorite machines. The blood comes through all these little tubes, and each blood sample is separated by a bubble. And the bubble keeps each of them separate from the other. And so there's no mix-up of the patients. And the computer figures everything out, and the answers come out there through the printer. And then the technologists, like myself, look at the printouts, see if they're normal. In some ways, the factory floor is the absolute weirdest place for a computer to be, you know, because you're not, you're not supposed to drop them, you're not supposed to shake them, you're not supposed to bounce them, you're not supposed to have magnets around them, you're not supposed to freeze them, you're not supposed to uh, basically do anything except let them set. Of course, you got uh, some uh, computers sitting out next to a stamping plant, and uh, things go wrong with it, and a good chunk of our troubleshooting um, relates to stuff that happens out on the, on the factory floor. Jeff Peters is a systems engineer for electronic data systems. He is also a manager of a team of systems engineers as project leader. At EDS, Jeff's chief client is General Motors. He helps GM with the computer systems that run the GM plants, systems that keep track of the worker stations, the parts they need, robots that build some of the car's components, where each car is on the assembly line, and the testing of the final product. Everybody who calls when they call a hotline are a number one priority, or else they wouldn't be calling the hotline. And so you have to shuffle through that and try to make sure that the, that the most uh, responsible decision gets made as to uh, 
Or what gets solved first? I make mistakes, but it's important to take those risks too. Um, in fact, I probably wouldn't wouldn't be in the position I'm in now if I didn't make any mistakes because that would have meant that I hadn't taken enough risks to uh, be able to do a good job. I would have an interview set up with a professor and I would walk into his office. Now remember, I'm only 43 inches in height. I look different from other people. I'd walk into his office and the first reaction would be, the professor would sit there in shock, mouth hangs open, he doesn't know what to say, he's speechless, right? So I learned to take advantage of that moment of silence, to take the initiative myself and sort of take control of the interview myself. And I would say with a smile, very pleasantly, hi, I'm Ann Swanson, I'm here for my interview. You're probably wondering how I handle laboratory work. At this point, the prof is still speechless and he goes, ah, he nods, yeah. And I would go into a description of the laboratory work that I've done and how I handle lab work. Ann Swanson is an associate professor of chemistry at Edgewood College in Wisconsin. Her primary responsibilities are teaching and research. She is also chairperson of the Department of Physical Science and coordinator of the Medical Technology Program at Edgewood. When I finished my doctorate degree, I then changed fields somewhat and did four years of postdoctoral research in cancer research. The name of that area is a mouthful. It's chemical carcinogenesis. What that really means is studying the way that chemicals that come into our bodies are changed or metabolized in our bodies to become cancer-producing agents. And I was studying, in particular, a series of chemicals which are found naturally occurring in spices. Some people pulled my parents aside and they said, you know, your son really has gone into the left field. He has these fantasies that he wants to go to medical school. It's totally unrealistic. Uh, you've really got to redirect him. David Hartman, MD, graduated from Temple University Medical School. He is a general psychiatrist now in private practice in Roanoke, Virginia. Dr. Hartman was the first okay. blind person in this country to graduate from medical school. Probably one of the most interesting parts of my work is seeing hospitalized patients. These would be patients who have uh, possibly had a, a heart attack or cancer and they're struggling with the issues around how to accept their medical situations. And in some cases these are patients that have severe chronic pain and I might be talking to them about how to cope with the discomfort that they're experiencing. What is exciting to me about this type of work is it deals with quality of life. Can you describe what it feels like? Cotton. Cotton. Store of cotton. Yeah. It doesn't have a yucky feel, does it? Anybody else want to try? Somebody broken the yucky? Andy? Jeff Hemmelstein teaches biology and environmental science at Columbia High School in Maplewood, New Jersey. He wears a hearing aid and reads lips in order to help him hear. In large groups, he must use an oral interpreter. Teaching science in high school is Jeff's life work. It is an outgrowth of his personal beliefs and values. When you take a look at the human mind in terms of what it has done and what it can do, you can go no higher because regardless of technology, regardless of, of uh, rocketry, regardless of medical advancement, the human mind is always behind it. Then the question is, what can we do to deal with that? And there really is nothing better to deal with that than being a teacher. 
because you are basically working with the human mind. You're putting ideas in, you're challenging kids. Uh, it, it's taking a theme of evolution to the highest level. I've taken, oh, I would say close to 200 uh, people over the past five years on trips down to Mexico into the jungle. I've taken teachers, I've taken students. Uh, we spend time uh, looking for animals, uh, exploring the Mayan ruins, uh, and that has become a very, very meaningful part of my life. Uh, I've practically been adopted by Indian families. They even have a Mayan name. They call me Chuk Khan, which in Maya means to catch snakes. I knew Martha a couple of years, I guess, really before we got to be friends. And I, right away you knew how sharp she was, you know, and what a mind she had and should be encouraged to do something with her life. And then when she became interested in computer science, I, I thought that was perfect because you can be totally <laughs> handicapped and still be a scientist. It was really frustrating because they, they would take one look at me and think, she can't do anything. They didn't, they didn't even give me a chance to, to prove anything. They just took a look. It took Martha Burks 15 years after high school to convince her counselors to support her efforts to go to college, get a degree, and get a job. Martha is now a computer programmer for the University of Cincinnati Computing Center. She recently received a letter of commendation from the Associate Vice President of the University for her contribution to an important project. In the space of two years, Martha has received two promotions. Martha's supervisor, Rudy Kammerer, manager of the Computing Center, describes Martha's work. She works as a member of a team. The analogy might be if you build a house, you have the architect designs the house, and then the contractor builds the house. Well, Martha is like the contractor. She actually builds the program, whereas the systems analyst is like the architect and designs the program, or the system. Yes, I, th I think we were kind of anxious. It, it was a new experience. You know, uh, In fact, I did talk to each of the individuals on our team to you know indicate that it might be, you know, a little bit different, a little harder to talk and communicate initially until you get used to, to the way she communicates. And uh, I think that fear, you know, was there at the beginning, yes. But I think with, as, as we got to know Martha better, you know, we understand now how to, how, how to work with her. The position is such that, you know, it's a matter of working with a computer terminal and it might take Martha a little longer to enter because it's like, a keyboard like a typewriter and she has to enter things in so it takes a little longer but uh, really there's no adaptions to her equipment. It's basically uh, the programming is a mental process and mentally she's ahead probably equal to or better than most of us in the organization. This is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm, doing I'm doing something really um, productive. I'm bringing taxes which makes me feel good. I used to when I was, well, before I worked, uh, everybody complained about paying taxes. I thought, I wish I could complain about paying taxes. <laughs> and, um, it's something that people take for granted. I, I, I sure don't take it for granted. <laughs> I'm very honored to work uh, for the Naval Weapons Center because it is a part of our de Department of Defense. It comes in that arena and uh, I feel a lot of national pride in working uh, here at NWC. June Rooks is a physicist who works for the Naval Weapons Center in China Lake, California. Most of the work she does is top secret and so she cannot tell us about the specifics of her job. A few years ago, June helped evaluate the performance of new jet airplanes and how they deliver weapons. She worked on the simulation of the flight programs of the A-6 aircraft. It's a lot easier to solve problems with computer simulation. If you want to make changes, you first do it on the computer and then in the airplane itself. I'm the current capabilities analyst for U.S. weapons, and that means that if anyone has a question about the characteristics or capabilities of any missile system or maybe any aircraft, they come and ask me. 
it, if I don't know right offhand, I have to find an answer for them. More or less, my background in physics has trained me how to think. I have some, I have developed some problem solving techniques and I can use these over and over. I've always liked math. I think when I, my formal education started when I was about the fourth grade. I really learned that home from my parents and other kids in the neighborhood before this. And for some reason, I just like mathematics. My uh, family was a very religious family. We uh, did a lot in the church, and that's how I learned to read, really, reading Sunday school lessons and uh, taking part in Sunday school programs and making speeches in church and whatnot. These scientists are able to function so well at work because of accommodations and adaptations that have been made. Most accommodations at work are relatively simple and much less expensive than one might imagine. Usually the supervisor and the employee sit down together to decide what's needed. Creativity seems to be the key to accommodations at work. Creativity and the fact that each of our scientists is a unique individual with unique needs. In some ways the adaptations that, uh, that uh, the companies made uh, has been sort of, it's sort of boring. Um, you know, there's, this building is accessible. Um, they put a mirror in the, in the men's bathroom that was lower uh, so I could make sure my tie was straight. Probably the niftiest piece of um, equipment is this little desktop, laptop actually, portable computer that uh, I've got here. It's the first time in my life that I've been able to go into a meeting and take notes. We really do run in a world where um, business is what makes us go. And the reason I got this is not, um, is not because it was a right or a privilege, it was because they're making some money off of me. And so it was worth investing it. I always communicate to my students in the beginning of the year that I am deaf and that I cannot hear. And I lay certain ground rules. I tell them that they are not to speak when I'm speaking, that they ought to raise their hands so that we understand each other from the very beginning. So the kids work with me. And it's part of my philosophy that I will not allow them to make me handicapped. They know that I'm disabled. And if they put me into, or I am put into a situation where I become handicapped, I'm not at all happy with that. I clearly accept the fact that I'm disabled. I refuse to accept the idea that I'm handicapped because I can't make myself handicapped. Patients will come in uh, to the office, for example, or I'll meet them in the hospital, and right away I let them know that I'm blind. I don't want them to have any misunderstandings. I don't want them to go through half the interview thinking that it's a little odd that he needs help getting into the room. Uh, secondly, I'll take a few braille notes, maybe go into any medications they're on, past medical history. Uh, the rest of the interview probably proceeds as uh, with any other, any other psychiatrist. Obviously, in doing a physical, I can do a physical the same as every other physician, except for the eye exam and ear exam. The accommodations made for Martha by her employer were modest. She needed a push-button telephone, and her shelves were moved to a more usable level. The most expensive modification was the removal of a wall in the bathroom, which was replaced by a curtain for privacy and ease of use. I think the first thing I asked for was to lower my shelves on either side because I couldn't reach, reach way up in my shelves. No, therefore, I can reach them. Martha arranged for her personal needs herself. She hired a personal care attendant and designed the drinking bottle which she uses at work. She also had her wheelchair adapted so that it would fit under her desk.
Despite the fact that they work hard at successful careers, these scientists and technologists have found time to enjoy family life, special interests, travel, and recreation. They have all found things to do that they enjoy, and friends and family to share the good times with. A career in science and technology has contributed a great deal to the overall satisfaction these people feel about their whole lives. for careers in science and technology begins in high school or even earlier with as many courses in science, mathematics, and computers as possible. Encouragement from parents, brothers, and sisters also plays an important role in helping students over the rough spots. But above all, it's the students themselves that must take the responsibility for seeing they get the education they want and deserve. I had chores to do like the other kids did, and once I decided, gosh, I think I'll just take my braces off and go to bed and see if I can get away with it. And a couple hours later, my mom got me up. I had to put my braces back on. I had to do the dishes. And so that was the end of that. I just did what I had to do. And my parents always encouraged me to be a doctor. Even though I was at home, I hadn't even started uh, grammar school yet. They always encouraged me to go to college, and uh, we were a very poor family. There was no money for formal educations, but I believe they were trying to shape goals or set goals for me. I felt that my parents were trying to say, reach for the stars, so if you don't make it, you'll at least be around the cloud. Another key factor in my family was my sister. My parents tended to be a little over-supportive, which is, I think is normal. And my sister, on the other hand, realized very quickly on oh that there was so much work to be done around the house. If you divided that work between she and her brother, then it would be half as much work for her. If she had to do it all, it was going to be pretty tough. So she became very creative in finding ways in which her blind brother could do dishes, vacuum, all types of little projects around the house. And the other thing was that if it wasn't done right, my mother would say, oh, Dave, you did a great job. Don't worry. And my sister would say, Mom, don't tell me. It was terrible. Dave, you've got to do it over. Uh, Bobby was a very key person in forcing my parents to treat me like anybody else. My early education was primarily due to my parents. They, my teacher would let me get by with murder. But my parents saw to it that I got every lesson. The math. I took in high school was not as complete as we would like to have had. We didn't get out of two until the last year, and then we had to fight for it. And my mother and father are stubborn, and so I think I got a double dose of stubbornness. Many students today are in the same process of preparing themselves for careers in science and technology. They recognize the importance of taking all the math and science courses in high school that they can. These students are taking classes in science and math that are sometimes hard, sometimes easy, but always valuable. Most students have a favorite course, and a course they find difficult. When you get to chemistry, you can do all these neat experiments with chemicals and stuff. Everything you do with, it has to do with math, you know? You need even like just problem solving and things. Math is pretty much just, I mean, every kind of job, you know. So the new kinds of jobs like computers and things, it's all math, so you have to know it. Biology is my favorite class because we, we get to do all sorts of interesting um, experiments and stuff. I guess I just, I just like seeing 
learning all the, the different things in nature, how the human body works and everything. You know, I've thought of computers, that uh, one part of science that I'm interested in. The courses are fun, but it can be hard. Trigonometry, I find, could be difficult sometimes, but it's exciting. I like it. It's fun. Algebra were my favorite. Geometry, the pits. I like math, but it's really difficult for me because the teacher gives us so much homework. and. Sometimes they get a little sick of it. Many students have to try extra hard to pass a difficult course. You don't have to get all A's and B's to become a scientist or technologist. Well, right now, I got a very easy math class because algebra didn't work out too well, and I ended up failing that class. So I went to one easier class, and I'm doing pretty well in that. So it's coming along all right. My 10th grade teacher, Mr. Ben Staden, um, Overbrook High School, he's pushed me through. I was, the first semester I got an F in his class. I worked it up to a C. And he really has told all his students about me and, you know, pushing me out to go and be what I wanted to be too. Yeah, I like hard teachers because they're the ones who make, who push you. You know, you don't like it at the time, but you'll be grateful to them in the long run. You'll be grateful for them. And you have to really be tenacious and just keep in here because times will get rough. Work will get harder. You just have to keep in here and try. Sometimes students in math and science classes have to cope with other students who have a hard time learning to accept them. Most of the time, people are pretty good about it. And I really haven't encountered any problem with those two classes, okay. with people you know, not accepting it or, or me. And if they do, I kind of just say, if you don't like it, well, it's too bad. You know, because I have just as much, much right as anybody to go after whatever I want. In addition to taking math and science classes, there are other ways important ways to prepare for a career. Extracurricular activities, such as science projects, science clubs, working in a lab, volunteer work, or tutoring, all offer good scientific and social experience. In the summer, between my junior and senior years of high school, I attended a special program funded by the National Science Foundation at a university nearby. I was the first disabled kid that they had ever had in that program. The benches were way too high for me. The equipment went from the floor to the ceiling. And it gave me the opportunity to learn how would I need to adapt when I got into a university setting and went to college myself, for real. And also, it was very valuable because it gave me an opportunity to show that I can handle university-level lab work. And it was an important foot in the door when I was later applying for colleges. It's also important for every young person to have a mentor, no matter what profession you want to go into. A mentor is a person with experience in a field you're interested in, who can act as your guide. It's especially important for disabled youngsters to have mentors and role models. Meeting with and talking to scientists and technologists already pursuing their careers provides good information and builds your confidence. If a youngster who has a disability would like to find a role model or a mentor, there are many places to start. One good place, I think, is the American Association for the Advancement of Science. They have a resource group of handicapped scientists and engineers, of which I'm a member. And they can alert you to the disabled scientists who are in the field you're interested in, who live in your geographical area, uh, who may have a similar type of disability to you. The deaf dentist was really nice. I even spoke to him after the luncheon. And we, he and I are very alike because we have same goals. And before the luncheon, 
My friend said, no, you can't be a doctor because you have to hear everything. But that sentence encouraged me to go on further, and I'm very happy with that guy. After high school comes college, a challenge both academically and socially. Options in college range from a two-year associate's degree from a junior or community college to a bachelor's degree from a four-year college or university. The challenges can be difficult, but the reward's great. Students must work hard academically, find ways around obstacles, seek out the supports that they need, and be persistent in working towards their goals. Being disabled, yeah, I did feel kind of odd. You know, I was the only one, and um, sometimes I felt like I, I, I would get very frustrated at times because I just couldn't move around the lab as fast. But you know, I got through it and and, and uh, did a pretty good job. So, and in retrospect, I'm I feel really good about it. <laughs> I couldn't take too many courses at the same time because it was just physically impossible. And then it came to lab work. I needed someone to draw for me. So I would hire someone to help me with drawings and things. Another area in college that I had to contend with was that of anatomy. A student would sit next to me. He would dissect the structures and then let me feel the structures as we were studying them. He would spend extra time on Sundays and Saturdays going over the structures with me. Uh, the other side of it is that not only did he help me, but of course helped himself because he not only had to learn it for himself, but for me, and he probably had the highest grades of anybody in our, in our class. To assist the student with disabilities, Many colleges have an Office of Disabled Student Services. There are many services available if the student needs them. These services include such things as providing special equipment, making special arrangements for taking tests, early registration, finding accessible housing, arranging for interpreters and note takers, and help in course selection and program planning. As students become more familiar with what is required in college and more confident in their ability to be successful, the need for support services often diminishes. Students should try to take advantage of the many social activities that colleges offer. Making time for fun and relaxation in a busy schedule is important to a healthy life. If a student decides to go to graduate school, she or he may get the opportunity to take advanced courses and do important research. I'd say that I really love neuroanatomy. I mean, um, we got to dissect you know, a human brain all by ourselves. It's just uh, incredible that, that all the processes by which we think and feel have anatomical correlates, you know, that there are things, you know, that there are structures responsible for um, different parts of our uh, thinking and functioning, everything that we do. So it, to me, it's fascinating that it's real. I can, I can touch it. I can, you know, trace it. And um, plus, it's very beautiful. I mean, there are structures that within the brain that are just, you know, lovely. There's this one area called the hippocampus, which is thought to be responsible for memory processes that is shaped like a seahorse. But the exciting parts of science are proposing the questions and trying to analyze what your results are, what they mean, and um, whether they mean anything or whether you can go on with it. It's hard to believe that successful people have ever had to face the possibility of failure. But the fact is that most of us will have to face discouragement and barriers at some point in our lives. Each of our scientists has had to face discouragement more than once but they've survived, gone ahead, learned something, and become stronger. Out of disappointment can come new dreams for the future. There was a time in college when I really was convinced I'd never get into medical school. It was my senior year. Uh, I think it was um, the end of May. I'd gotten rejected from every other medical school. And I had come to grips with the idea I'd never get in. 
And so I had to face that. And I was able to deal with it. It, it was not easy. It wasn't fun. But it was a growth experience. And I really believe that if, you know, if a, if a child wants to go on and become an astronaut or become a physicist and finds out the last minute he can't make it, the process has been an exciting experience and has prepared the person for other areas. I was discouraged from considering teaching as a career because I went deaf. Uh, the argument being that my speech was not good enough. The argument was that uh, because of my deafness, I could never control a classroom. So I was discouraged from being a teacher. But I liked the teaching. And what I began to do was do a little bit of substitute teaching, and I found that I liked that even more. And lo and behold, there was an opening, opening here at Columbia High School. I applied for it, and I got it, and that's 18 years ago. Disabled women may have a double bind. We are viewed as a woman, well, maybe a woman doesn't belong in a scientific career. A disabled person, oh, a disabled person doesn't belong in a scientific career. And both of those misconceptions put together can create a double bind for us and make it doubly difficult. So I think for us it is especially important that we take the initiative to be assertive about what we can do and all the good things that we have done and that, that, that we will be able to do in the future. When I was visiting my sisters uh, in Mississippi once, uh, I met someone on the street who said that, gee, we didn't expect you to become a physicist. We didn't even expect you to finish high school. But I said to myself, you had no idea how I felt about me. It doesn't matter uh, how people feel about me. I'm the beginning of everything that's to happen to me in my life. And it doesn't matter if it seems that all the chips are down. I'm going to strive to overcome whatever obstacle that gets in my way. Now, more than ever before, opportunities in science and technology exist for young people with disabilities. We're beginning to realize that with good support from family, teachers, with a good education and motivation, young people with disabilities can succeed in careers they never dared to dream about. The rewards are great, challenge, excitement, pride, and a secure future. By preparing early, students can now open the doors to a career in science. I plan to take chemistry next year. And hopefully, if I pass that, I want to become some, a lab technician or something like that. I'm interested in engineering. I, I'm thinking of doing that possibly later. You know, I'm working my way up, you know, because it's difficult. So. Starting out you know, a little bit low, eventually I might try to make, get into engineering. I wanted to be a professor or a doctor. Yes, I hope to become. I am thinking of being a doctor. Listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.